progress on your CX-5 bird? Actually, I am uh, pulled off that right now. Oh. I'm uh, finishing up, uh, I have a project in my yard to finish around my pool and everything. Okay. That's taken a lot of effort. So I pulled off the plane until I get that done. And with the, with the, uh, with that coronavirus and everything and staying away from uh, large groups, I, I just doing this temporarily, get this done. Then, then I'm back on the plane. Okay. That's all right. Hey, we just had thunder here. That's unusual. Is that what I heard? I thought I heard something. So yeah. Okay. A couple weeks ago, it was really sharp, okay, and uh, that only happens once or twice a year. Yeah. Well, I'm making slow progress on that CX-7. I, I uh, had to order up some, well, I thought I had to order some more aluminum, so I got that this week, and then I went to put it where I store my aluminum angle and I found that I had already had like four bars. So oh. it's like, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think to go and look. I just, in my yeah. head, it was like, no, I don't have any more. I need, need to order some. So I, I stalled for like three days because of that. And then I finally went and got some. It's like, Oh yeah, I guess I didn't need to stop. So, Oh, well now, now I got to figure out. Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm working on behind the center sp section spar, uh, kind of under the seat area and where the landing gear will mount. So I'm working on that part. Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of the next, the next segment and then seat back bulkhead and kind of keep working back from there. So, you know, progress, I'll take it. So sounds good. Yeah. So, so you guys going to watch the SpaceX launch this afternoon here? Hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that was happening. It was supposed to happen on, I think it was Wednesday. Last week. Yeah. Earlier this week. Yeah. And, uh, and they had to call it due to weather. And so it's supposed to go, I think it's, I want to say it's 430 Eastern time today. Actually, I pulled it up in a browser here. We'll have to do that. I think it's well, 322. SpaceX is here in uh, either Bellevue or Redmond. Okay. Uh, Three twenty-two Eastern. Okay, yeah. So I'm I'm wrong. So it's two, so it's two thirty Central. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad I. Yeah, and then if today doesn't work, then tomorrow at three p.m. Eastern. So. Okay, I'm gonna update my calendar reminder because otherwise I'll miss it. Yeah, it's a little time sensitive when they're doing that. Yep. I used to be in Langley, Virginia uh, in Hampton at NASA and uh, we, uh, we had the backup computer for all the space launches. Oh, okay. Ate lunch with the astronauts and Very cool. our computer room is on second floor and watched them build the space capsules down uh, out the back door and balcony. Huh, that's pretty cool. What took you out to Seattle then? Just work or family or? No, the kids are here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Kids and grandkids. Kids, I don't understand that, but grandkids, that that makes sense. <laughs> no, I came over here from Florida. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. When was it that you were at uh, NASA Langley? Oh, in the early 60s. Wow. That would have been quite the time. Yeah, it was exciting times. I was back in the days of... Uh, well, I, I was with IBM then, worked on the computers, but uh, I also worked on uh, the old key punches. Okay. I don't know if you know what punch cards are. Yep, I do. <laughs> I is that, that in building 1268? 
Oh God, I have no idea what to do. And, and uh, they had a, uh, a verifier, they called it, okay, which was like a key punch. And they put a stack of cards, probably, uh, oh, I don't know, 200 cards in the hopper and, and run the punch cards through for stress analysis. And if the machine jammed, that was the end of their stress analysis and everything broke usually. <laughs> ah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because Greg, you're out there now, right? Aren't you in, are you in Langley? Yeah, or? yeah that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Are you in Langley now? Yeah, sure am. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember the building numbers there. I worked all over the base, you know, in different installations. And then well, yeah, I, like the, uh, yeah, go ahead. I worked there at TAC headquarters, okay, and uh, TAC headquarters, uh, the computer room was on the second floor of the building. Uh, I was called in one night and worked on the computer uh, disk that uh, they stored all of the uh, information on airfields around the world, even dirt strips down to 2,000 feet. And uh, oh, wow. I don't know. They called me at probably two in the morning and it was summertime. I threw on a pair of shorts and uh, went in and worked on the machine. And I was still there at seven o'clock the next morning when the generals came down the hall and, and I was headed out to get a part or something. And, and the old general looked at me with shorts and t-shirt on and he said, who are you? And I, I told him and, and uh, I said, I've been working on your computer all night. He said, uh, you're not allowed in here. I said, well, you want your computer fixed? And he said, uh, uh, no. And so I left. <laughs> I said, wow. I'm out of here. <laughs> you can get somebody else. <laughs> huh. so he, didn't have any, he didn't have any information for his briefing that morning. Hmm. Interesting. I see uh, Chris is here. How are you this morning, Chris? Oh, I think you're on mute. There we go. Morning. Hey, all right. I'm a CX-5 builder. I think one or two guys I've interacted with a little bit. Bert, maybe. But uh, no, some of the other um, CX-5 builders over, over the time. Cool. Uh, Good deal. So my project, I've got, uh, I have a wing kit from, uh, from Greg Westbury in the SPAR and about ready to close uh, the wing, uh, the other wing. And uh, but I, I suspect um, I'm willing to sell these wings. I think I'm gonna gonna stop this project for now. And uh, so I don't know if anybody's interested in the wings. I think I'm gonna post it uh, next week. It might be useful to someone who's building a, a CX-7. Gotcha. Yeah, the, if you're getting ready to close them, then you might want to hold off on closing them unless you're just clicking them or something because uh, the CX-7, the fuel tank is in front of the uh, spar. And so uh -huh. there's, yeah, it's a little different. So there's the building uh, manual says to close the, close and rivet the wing and then cut open the, the skin. But the more I look at that, I think there's probably a, way you could do it without closing it first. Your way. Yeah. You know, one's closed and one's not closed, but I figure if somebody wants to buy the wing, they're better off to buy it, make it, you know, have a look inside of it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, too. Um, well, that's cool. How long have you been working on your uh, 6.5, then? 
So uh, yeah, probably three years or something like that. It's uh, number 57. And uh, yeah, I, work, I worked on it a lot, but I got it. Uh, I, I uh, was under the assumption that I would never pass a medical. And so I went to LSA and uh, I passed a medical. And so now with, uh, with basic med, I can fly uh, basic med. And then uh, along came a partnership and a Grumman Tiger. So I got that. Nice. And uh, I think um, if I were to do it again, I would get a kit and not, and not scratch build. I think, uh, um, although, you know, at the time with the wing kit helped me a lot, but um, I have an issue with, uh, with Thatcher's. It's at least the CX-5 is the documentation. The documentation, I think, is, is, uh, is very, like it's, it's minimal. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's minimal. It's made to be a hand-built, kind of build-it-as-you-go airplane. And uh, I think that costs a lot of time to uh, to figure things out as you go. It would be a lot more efficient if every if the manual and the documentation was a lot clearer. Yep, I I agree. I think there's uh, there's some gaps there. It's definitely. I think there's got, reason, there's got to be a reason why there's only two CX fives flying after uh, after what four or five years. Yeah, uh, when yes. I don't know, I don't know why the CX fours didn't have that problem, but there there it, there must be a reason. There must be a reason, and that would be a concern on the CX seven for is you know documentation or discrepancies in the documentation until it's uh, the bugs have been worked out. And even for the CX five, sorry to complain, but there's no there's no log of of uh, discrepancies that. You know, that could be, uh, that'd be my number one suggestion. Dave should post a log of these discrepancies so that, you know, they, not everyone would need to scratch their head about some of these things. Yeah, if I can chime in here, uh, on my CX-5, I know exactly how you're, you feel with regard to lack of documentation. Uh, it's kind of like every time you, you, you get to some area with it's vague, you have to go, okay, uh, I'd, I'd talk to Dave or something. And one of his response to me was, well, just handle it. And I go, okay. So that's been my that's how it, that's, how that's the philosophy. And that's the, it is what it is. That's what the philosophy is. It's just a yeah. hand. It's a hand built as you go. And when you come up across something that's within an eighth of an inch or whatever, you, you fabricate mm -hmm. like a carpenter, what you fabricate to make it work. And then off you go. And I think one of the, things that slow you down a lot is the complexity of the cockpit where you have to make everything work together. Now I'm, I'm one of the things holding me back right now is I have to figure out a way to get, I'm, I'm putting cabin ventilation. I put in uh, those NACA inlets underneath the wing and then bring it into the cockpit. So uh, getting that to work with all the stuff that's already installed, uh, it's got, it's a mind bender. Were you on last week when Rob Flood was showing us his plane? Yeah. yeah. Did you see his uh, his vents on the side? I saw there? those. Those are very good. I don't know if that's I, something that you could – Yeah, I, that you seems like that. a really simple way to go. I do that, but I, I've, I've determined – I also saw – I'm forgetting who it was, but it had the CX-5 out in the desert, and they had the inlets underneath the wing. That's a high-pressure area, and it just brings in a lot of air. So that's what I'm. That's what I'm going for is the the quantity of, of ventilation. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw Rob's and I thought, boy, that's. It doesn't get much simpler than that, just because. Yeah, you, simple is good. Yeah, simple is good. I mean, it doesn't have all the things of piping and all this. I know. I know. Kinda, no, 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 nothing against what you're doing at all. I no, just, no, I, I know. Like, it, that's sometimes that's, I bite off way more than I want. <laughs> yeah. Hey Ben, aren't you uh, lofting the plans for the six seven on the computer? Uh, I'll be. I'm. Hey, it's Brian Wallstrom. Um, hey, good morning, guys. Morning. So, uh, how's it going, Brian? Uh, yeah, Rob. Uh, so the CX seven. Yeah, I, I have start. I've done some of it. Um, the fuselage. What I'm running into is to do. There, there's the uh, lingerons. The upper longerons have a twist to them. And to accurately model that, 
is kind of a nightmare. So I'm trying to decide if I'm going to literally, like, to use your word, loft the the um, the location it mounts to. I guess it's be a, a 90 degree from horizontal uh, location at the firewall and then to the whatever eight degree twist it is at the center section spar and then going back from there how that twist comes out so that's what I'm trying to figure out how I want to handle that so I kind of have two two thoughts one is ignore the twist and model it like a flat bar and then basically the when I model all the other uprights and everything, it would um, I would just have a, a gap in the CAD model, which doesn't matter since I'm not actually going to run. Right. Um, I, you know, it's an assembly, right? So I, I would each individual piece, as long as they're the the whole locations are accurate, it doesn't totally matter. So that would be one way that would be simple to do it. And you probably put um, a note on it. Yeah. Well, and the thing is too, the CAD I wouldn't. I wouldn't share the CAD directly. I would be pulling drawings from the CAD to then, you know, basically to as a blueprint to hand out to, right? You know, basically what I would do is I'd take those blueprints that I would create, hand those to Dave, and if he wants to incorporate those into the plans, then that's as a, a more accurate yeah, dimension. Drawing. And, and for price. Well, whichever. I mean, you know, we have an agreement, so yeah. You know, but uh, but that sort of thing, or do it as a supplement, kind of like. Um, I don't know if I, I think I showed you guys last week. I have the, the Bearhawk Patrol plans, and there's this. Uh, I can't remember who did it here. I think it says on this. Um, you build a Bearhawk next? Uh, Eric Newton. Uh, no, no, I was looking at building a Bearhawk before I, I found the Thatchers. But so the Bear, the uh, the CX7 builder's manual is this. Okay. The Bearhawk Patrol Builder's Manual. <laughs> is that? <laughs> and I think, I think Chris, is that, to your point, that's this is what we need for this the Thatchers. That or, was, um, I don't know if anybody's looked at the BK Flyer site, but it's a very similar airplane, right? And uh, the, you know that site has one picture per step. I mean, you know, per individual step. It's really it's another way to do it, right? Is the BK fly? That's the uh, yeah. It's a single seat, it almost like a midget Mustang or something, right? Yeah, it's a, just a single seat, not not all that different from a Hummel or something. Okay, uh, but I mean one, yeah, one picture per like get your ruler and draw this line, you know, like that. yep, yeah. So, so I'm actually actively looking at um, at basically doc documentation software for doing online documentation with versioning to do, to maybe not initially get that specific, but it, I think it would be very nice to have, you know, okay, here's how you make your, here's how you assemble this, these assemblies, grab this part, this part, and this part, and apply part numbers to everything, which is missing right now, um, because it's kind of hard to have a conversation about, look on, you know, Blueprint sheet. This the top left. There's that one thingy that has the angle. To it. It's kind of tough. So, but applying part numbers to everything would be nice. And then you know have a breakdown of individual assemblies. And so, um, yeah. So slowly getting there. Just slowly. So, but yeah, I think Chris, I very much appreciate your your uh, input on that because yeah, I've I've kind of experienced the same thing with the CX7. So. What's going on, Brian? Hey, uh, I just got off of uh, four hours of editing. Put up another <laughs> another video. I've been uh, kind of batch editing the last couple of days. But hey, That's I awesome. got a message um, in reference to the topic at hand with everybody on here. I got a message from uh, Glenn Bradley, okay. and he said that the CX-7 is due to be inspected within the next 10 days, and that was three days ago. So... Cool. Uh, yeah, and as soon as that happens, I'll take a drive out there. I mean, that airport's only about two hours from me, so I'll take a drive out there and do another update. Um, you know, as soon as they're ready. You know, they might have this inspection in ten days, but they might not be done with what they're doing in ten days. You know. Sure, understood. 
So if you guys don't know, Brian Wallstrom has the Experimental Aircraft Channel on YouTube. Um, so he's done a bunch of videos, a bunch of interviews with all kinds of people from, I don't know, RANS, aircraft, to um, Zenith, to uh, Culver Props, uh, Air Momentum, all kinds of people, um, leaving out like everybody. But yeah, so uh, yeah, Brian does a good job. It's, has nice videos, very fun to- I love your videos. Yeah, it's good. So. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And he did really a couple of really good ones on the on the Thatchers, um, the CX-7 uh, as well. So yeah, it's been it's been good. So go look them up on YouTube if you have a chance, or or Facebook. I think you have you know, Facebook sites and yeah, okay. the, the CX CX-5 and CX-7. Uh, um, yeah, they're they're interesting aircraft. Anything that has uh, an option for plans building is of high interest to me because um, I'm a bit of a scratch builder myself. I love working with metal. So that's why I'm excited about what's going on here with you guys. Well, and you're building a, a Zenith right now, right? Currently, I am building a Zenith, which actually started about five years ago, but I moved four times in five years, so that slowed down. But that that was one of the reasons why I chose that because uh, it offers plans as well as the kit and components. So you can kind of choose off the menu what you want or don't want to do. Um, so yeah, I exactly. scratch built my wings uh, or the tail kit or the fuselage kit. Um, so yeah, the Thatcher is obviously something that uh, anybody can handle. I mean, um, you can easily fabricate the forming blocks and cutting blocks and uh, uh, ribs might look difficult, but they're probably one of the easier things to make. Very true. Yeah. You're doing the 750, aren't you, Brian? I am, correct. Uh, the 750 Cruiser. You're doing the Cruiser? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an attractive plane. Uh, the vi visual outside is great. Yeah, yeah. What is the, I, I mean, I know there's a difference in the aerodynamics of the, the cruiser versus the stall, but um, what, like, with the wing or the fuselage, what, what are the specific differences on those two? Just out of curiosity. Well, the fuselage, the fuselage, for the most part, the exact same thing. The tail feathers attach a little bit differently. And it has the, the stole has a flying, all flying rudder, whereas the cruiser okay. has a vertical stabilizer and rudder. Um, the tails also has an inverted horizontal stabilizer to give you more of a down uh, force for stole purposes. Um, and otherwise, mainly the wing is a completely different airfoil. So, oh, okay, but but is it no slats, no um, correct sort of thing? Does the, does the cruiser have flaps as well or no? Uh, well, they both have flapper arms. That's what it is. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it has that kind of two-part uh, yeah. flapper on where it's kind of staggered and tw has that twist in it, or what? Or not twist? Correct. It's, Correct. And they and they do they do that as a cheap way of creating washout versus sure. trying to put a twist into the wing, which would be difficult to do. They just create washout, which is drag, unfortunately. But it's only a hundred to one hundred twenty mile an hour airplane, not a two hundred mile an hour airplane. So. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys have seen that, but they they have the the flaperons. I guess they are. I, I was thinking there were flaps on one of them, but but the flaperons are built in two, I guess roughly four foot sections, two half length sections, and or maybe it's not four feet. I guess six, eight, whatever it is. But two, they're they're kind of half wing sections, and they and they're instead of being joined, you know, perfectly aligned, there's like a half inch, three quarters an inch, something like that twist to it or not twist but they're just bolted together off a little so that it, like brian said it basically gives you washout which is kind of cool so yeah correct kind of and the thatcher doesn't the thatcher doesn't have flaps it has a, a speed brake correct right. on the back. yep yeah okay. which is a very interesting cool idea yeah it's very different so um it's interesting so okay I just want to jump on real quick and say hi. I got the notification through Facebook you're doing this. So I just want to jump on real quick and say, hey, I just been, like I said, editing for the past four hours. I'm going to go take a lunch break with the family. But I want to say hi to everybody and uh, looking forward to seeing your kit, your uh, projects uh, together and everybody else's projects here. So, and if you haven't, I'll go ahead and invite you all right now. If you haven't joined the uh, the group I started, I try to promote, say it with video. so kind of share what's going on in your shop garage hangar of your projects and give everybody updates across the board so it's not just thatcher it's not just zenith it's not just anything it's everybody all in one place 
Yeah, it's a Facebook uh, experimental aircraft channel group, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. All right, I'll well, check in with you guys again soon. Thanks for joining, Brian. All right, see you guys. Good to see you. Cool. I see another new name on here, Chuck C. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or... Or not, I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't want to, so. Sounds like you had a little audio, but uh, it's not clear. Hey, Chuck, are you there? Ben. Mart this is Martin, Ben. Hey, Martin, how are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Uh, I guess it's a subject that at some point is going to come up, but um, the, basically one of the factors is the fact of, you know, Dave's age. Is he have any plans in place to turn yep. the business over or whatever to be when he decides to retire? Yep, yep. So um, because I'm aware of what he, his plans are. That being said, I'm not sure how much he wants that to be public knowledge. So I will hold that close to, to, to my chest. Um, he does have a plan in place for transferring his business, the plans business, et cetera, um, uh, at the time when he's incapacitated or, or passes on. So yeah, there is a plan in place. So, yep. Um, I, I, and I mean, I, I just don't, I don't know how public he wants no, it. I just, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, some people, you know, go through life with the attitude that they're going to live forever. Yeah. And some people are more proactive and, yeah. you know, there's, there's been other designs over the years that have just disappeared because the designers, you know, whatever they retired, died, uh, left the country, whatever. And, they just disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at the Boyer Castrell, which is the all metal um, of the wooden plane that they had. And uh, he's down in Australia and probably uh, Dave's age, they, they don't state what his age is, but uh, uh, you can get plans for that. It's a neat looking aircraft. Hmm. Interesting. What did you say? It was the Boyer Kestrel. I, I, I think yeah. I've heard of the Kestrel before. I don't know. K, if K -E, well, K, the Kestrel is a, a big commercial plane, but this is a Boyer Kestrel. I'm, I'm thinking of the bicycle. Uh, Axel, Axel has his wooden plane that he flies and um, that is a neat looking. Uh, it's painted tan and brown. I don't know. Axel's published some pictures uh, of it. Okay. But Miles this, is, this is the all metal version. Huh. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. You, to... you can buy plans from him. It costs sixty five dollars to ship them up here from Australia. It says. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I just ship some parts down to some dollars, but it's very similar to the. Uh, 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 Thatcher CX-4 in uh, it's faster a faster plane okay but it's built for a VW engine okay yeah the days of the CX-4 is real similar to the F-21 if anybody knows what that is I think Martin I think you brought that up at Air Venture last year I did a bunch of research and digging yeah. into it and it, yeah it looks very similar to Somebody's got some wind noise. Um, but uh, I talked with David about that a while back, and uh, it was, um, it, there's actually quite a, there's visually, externally, there's a lot of similarities, but it's actually a fair amount different. But uh, I think there's a lot of design aspects that may or may have come from that design, it looks like. But, so. I see Tom joined. Hey, Tom, how are you this morning? Pretty good. Good. Good to have you on. Yeah, I thought I'd 
reach out to you and see if you'd, if you wanted to join back up or if you had any questions for us or anything. Um, Tom was on a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, he works uh, with, is, if I, I'm going to get this wrong, I'm sure, but uh, it's a high school kind of a industrial tech type program um, doing uh, aviation specific stuff. I'm, yeah. Uh, so yeah. I'm a high school teacher for aviation technology um, in Buffalo, New York, where I cover with juniors and seniors in high school, kind of a career in tech ed center, vocational tech, um, eight years running strong. And as I slowly expand and get there, I'm, I've always been enamored with the Thatcher airplane and um, just looking at all options and trying to get something started in the airplane type thing. But uh, I would have to bring it into the classroom. So it would have to be something that Hey, if I'm, I'm interested in it and I want to build it, that let, let the students experience kind of building an airplane that way. Um, there's no way the school would ever buy one. Yeah, understood. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I honestly didn't have a clue that there were, there was actually aviation tracks for high schoolers. It's kind of fantastic. So maybe I'll ship my son off to you when he gets to high school. <laughs> I think there's a, he said I heard that <laughs> one of the uh, schools here in Seattle do that uh, okay I was a member of their EAA over in Seattle and and one of the fellas uh, was helping out with their projects and they were doing the Zenith oh okay yeah I, forgot, I know which name I've been actually been to that school because um there's a conference that AOPA holds every year for high school programs because there's a huge youth initiative um, nationwide slash even worldwide. And I'm trying to think of the name of the school, but it's in, Se yeah, it's in Seattle because the conference was held there and we took a tour of it. It was right next to the Boeing field. Yeah, it's, it's right next door to Boeing. It's, I don't know, one of the hangar. Yeah, yeah. That's where they have their EAA uh, meetings. There's a lot of aviation programs worldwide or nationwide um, and expanding. Uh, we had 300 teachers at the last conference and they only wow. planned on like 150. Wow. That's great. That's fantastic. Just well, I know a note, note of information. Uh, you know what the Steen Skyvolt is? Sure. Uh, Steen was my uh, high school principal. Oh, really? And oh, that's cool. uh, I, we used to fly model airplanes and things, and uh, he was starting into radio control at that time. And then after that, he went to Denver and uh, was a uh, teacher there at the college where they built his original Steen Skyboat, and then he published plans and things. So interesting. Uh, interesting history. Uh, Real quick question. What was the name of the airplane that you were talking about when I jumped in? Oh, the Zenith uh, 750 Cruiser, I think. No. No. It, Rob was talking about it. Oh, the Castrell. It's a Boyer, B-O-Y-E-R, Castrell. It's K-E-S-T-R-E-L. It's out of uh, Australia. Just wanted to look up what it looked like. It looks like the fastback of the uh, uh, CX-4. Very similar. It's a little bit, I think it's a little bit shorter, a little bit less wingspans, a little bit faster. Somewhere in the 140 mile down range. Hmm. I'm not, I'm finding the one aviation Kestrel, which is not the, not the home built one. And I'm finding Kestrel aerial services. I'll find it for you here. Yeah. Put it in the chat if you would, Rob, when you find it. But, so you mentioned uh, the radio control stuff. Um, have you guys seen the EAA initiative uh, to promote radio control uh, airplane building as well as flying um, for kids. You guys have seen that one, but it looks kind of interesting. Um, 
Yeah, there's definitely tons of those initiatives out there, especially looking into what I do. Um, I, I've been actively looking into that kind of stuff and trying to get students to build. Yeah, this is the one I'm thinking of. I'll put this in the chat. Um, there's a, yeah, they started, an, or I think restarted an initiative last, last year around this. Uh, it's a LT40E Cadet. It's an electric uh, balsa built airplane. Looks pretty nice. Um, we had talked about it a little bit at our chapter. Um, we just we don't have a lot of younger guys. We have we have some um, we have a few that a few um, college age uh, guys out there, but most of them are. I'm 44 and I'm probably one of the younger two or three. Uh, but we have some we have some guys that have been around for a while and have some really interesting experience. So. Um, uh, it's been it's been really fun to get to know those guys. So, but. the problem with uh, radio controlled models <clears throat> is compared to what it was in my day, there's very few kits anymore, mm -hmm. and everything is already prefab box type stuff, or you yep. have to do plans built. The, the number of kits that used to be around. You know, with top flight and you know, um, Gull gillows you know, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just it's it's really hard for youth to kind of get into it. Like, I well, mean, like the the plane that well, the one that I built here a while back. Here, I'll go grab it here, but it's kind of in pieces because we crashed it a few times. But it's a uh, it's one of these foam board planes and. Uh, um, yeah, it's a little dusty, but it's just sitting in my office here. But um, yeah, it's just a foam one. But the construction techniques aren't the same. You know, you take a foam board and you bend it over, and now you're, there's your wing. You know, so um, I don't know. It's it's interesting, and I think it's it's fun to you know kind of keep people inspired about flying. But the building techniques aren't the same as the the real thing where you're building ribs and and uh, spars and that sort of thing. So. Um, but I don't know how much that transfers, but yeah, kind of interesting. I mean, it, it's the same thing with the full scale airplanes. You either have the complete kits now or the plans built, very few plans built, and there's not a lot of people like uh, Zenith that offer you the whole spectrum. Right. Yeah. I, I agree with that totally. Well, and it seems because, like, yeah, vans, you can't buy plants just plants you can't you can't do that you can buy well, a kit the original four that i had you could you could actually scratch build it if you wanted but oh. then he moved away from that yeah. and his assembly manual went from being a quarter but his plan basically disappeared so uh, um You know, the Thatcher is almost becoming a hybrid like Zenith with what Ben is uh, ramping up to be able to manufacture. Um, it's going to, as time goes on, be increasingly very much like that. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of my goal is to give you the best of both worlds. If you want to go and build the wings and, and order the fuselage, fuselage stuff, or if you want to order a few things from me and build everything else from scratch, kind of works for me. Um, the biggest issue is that um, there, there needs to be, you know, dimensionally, everything needs to be identical on the plans and the, and the, um, you know, the kit stuff, because otherwise you're going to end up using, you're going to end up with some issues. And so that's something that moving this into CAD will help with. Um, but, um, it's just, it's all time, I guess, but, um, just taking some notes here. Um, so one of the things I've been looking at, so we, we were talking earlier, uh, Chris brought up the, the issues with the documentation and, and Bert was uh, confirming that. And I know my experience has been that way too. Um, what, do, do you guys uh, have any examples of other airplane kits or just other documentation of any sort that, especially online documentation, that you think is done really well 
because right now I'm looking at a bunch of different documentation software for online documentation. So basically I would work on documenting everything from, you know, in individual parts, have a, a structure so you can print it out or you can just use it online. Um, videos, photos in, embedded. Uh, but I don't really have any good examples of other companies doing this very well. Uh, so I want to see if there's any, you know, best practices or, or ones that you guys have seen. So, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I built the, a couple of mini maxes and okay. stuck the, the, the builder's book was great because I've, I've built many, many models, radio control. And then I got a manual for a mini max. It was just like a radio controlled airplane where it's wood and fabric. And it just, it just built perfect. I mean, I, I I didn't even have both wings on the fuselage before I took it to the to the field to fly it, but um, uh, I, I put like 800 hours on that plane. But the manual itself was like you, first you do page one and you do those those steps, page two, et cetera. By the time you get to the end of the book, you've got an airplane. Yeah, it was gotcha. very it was very good. People yeah, did it that way. Yeah, just for that reason. It was great. Yeah, he, he knew his mark. We had a one of his dealers speak at our chapter years ago, and he said he specifically knew that he was trying to get people up from the model realm into the full size aircraft, and that's okay. why he did it that way. It was a definitely good flying airplane. I mean, I, I flew it to Oshkosh two years, 92 and 93, uh, put a lot of hours on it, and I had a half Volkswagen engine that I built. So, that was which a mini, go which ahead. Minimax did you build? Which uh, which model? The very like first to... one, the open oh, the cockpit. Uh, it just I forget what the model number is, but it was just the very first one that came out with the kit. The first kit I bought. Cool. The first kit I bought from Team. The kit with a little Rotex two seventy seven engine. The whole kit with the engine cost fifteen hundred dollars. Oh really? <laughs> really? And I flew it. <laughs> Probably broke the bank back then. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but but that two the uh, half Volkswagen engine, I built it from Mario Hummel's plans. Um, that that engine, I, I put I put eight hundred hours on it. I sold it to another guy, and he had to put another eight hundred on it. So it was a really a really nice little engine. I have another plane now that has a uh, the. Uh, uh, the manufactured version of that engine, it's, I uh, can't think of the name of it, but it's got a, a, a case and then the scat heads and and that engine is, is bulletproof, man. It, it will fly forever. Cool. So that, I really like Volkswagen engines. And I've got the Revmaster now, it's gonna be phenom phenomenal. Um, it's it, but the Minimax sure built quickly compared to uh, the CX-5 because, like you said, from the from the uh, uh, wing kit that I got from uh, Greg to to the plans, there are discrepancies, and th that caused me a, f a few uh, setbacks putting the uh, ailerons on, etc. Mm, gotcha. But if you're comparing the, the plans, the plans for the Minimax were, were very uh, uh, complete, whereas the plan, the, 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 just the, the plans for the uh, CX-5 is just like, this is what the plan should look like when you're done. Yeah. I think that's kind of the, the I spend a lot of time thinking about it and comparing multiple pages of the blueprints. And yeah. then comparing it to the builder's manual, then comparing it to photos online to figure out really what's the proper sequence. And, and so, yeah, that's been something that I, I really, I see as if, if I want my business be making parts to grow, then I need to lower the difficulty of making these so that we have tons of them flying. So people see them all over because Bert, when yours is flying and people see it, they're going to be like, Hey, what's that? That's really yeah. nice. Yeah. And you're going to start telling about 
about it. And, yeah. and, you got and, five years to build one. <laughs> Right, but it, but then if you know if we can drop that to uh, yeah, oh exactly two and a half years, three years, and, you know, and you've got the right idea of, of of making some manual or something that shows a sequence of of, of steps. Do yeah. this, do this, do this. Well, it's like I showed you guys that Bearhawk Patrol plan or the the manuals. Those aren't the manuals from Bob Barrows. Those are the, those are manuals that another guy built, uh, drew up and and wrote. That's a great up. idea. And so it's it's kind of complementary to the the actual plans and builder's manual that's, that you get when you buy the plans. And it wasn't expensive. I think it was like 50 or 75 bucks or something like oh, that. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me that it, if that makes the difference between, you know, sitting here and scratching your head and, and then actually getting it done and flying, that's well worth it. You know, that's so. the thing in that case, I think that people would not lose interest in building it at a certain point because I think people get stymied we're working at this every, every step is like, you have to figure out what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think of, I always thought of, you know, if you're, if you're buying a kit from Vans or brands or Zenith, yeah. whoever you, you know, I, I haven't looked at all those plans or those builders manuals or anything, but you think, you think, I think about Legos, right? When, when I'm helping my son build Legos or something, you get step one, you need these three parts and you put them together like this picture. Step two, you need these four parts and you put them, you know, and, um, it, it it seems like it seems like that would really you get the sequence of events so you aren't putting something together and then taking it apart and trying it a different way you aren't riveting something and then having to drill out rivets you aren't doing it in the wrong order right. you get w what specific items so that's where the part numbers I think come in I, I don't think it's mandatory but I think it's really helpful to have a part number on everything mm -hmm. uh, for me it's helpful just from an inventory standpoint knowing you know oh if I'm pulling a wing rib kit, I need six of these, 12 of those, whatever. But from a end builder standpoint, just knowing that, yes, this part and this part look very similar, but they're not the same, you know? So being able to see that, uh, that they're different and not misassemble, you know, di assemble something incorrectly. But yeah, that would be a great benefit. Then. Yeah. So I'm going to try and do that as I'm building the CX-7. I've been, I bought this camera just for that purpose and I'm video taking videos and I got this thing. So <laughs> videos and photos and, uh, you know, trying to get real high res stuff so that I can put those into a, an online builder's manual. Um, and yeah, well, just trying to put, if you put one of those manuals together, I'll buy one anyway. Oh, I'm just going to put it online. Um, the, okay. the only question is, are, am I going to have it open to anyone in the world can look at it or is it going to be locked down to people who have own plans? And I don't know if there's a really good reason to do it either way. Hmm. But anyways, that's, that's kind of the only, uh, only, uh, thing. But yeah. I, I figure if I do it online, then you can print it out if you want, but it's, if it's online, I can embed photos and videos at high res. So you can zoom in and see what's going on. And it seems like a good plan. So. I think that would help people that are there's starting to build this thing. And I don't think they would lose interest as quickly. Yep. The other thing. So here's a question for you. Um, you, you guys have all seen the, the um, rudder kits that Zenith and Rands and Bands, all those guys sell these rudder kits, right? You can, for three, 400 bucks, you can buy a rudder kit. You get Clecos and rivets with it, maybe you have some tooling, um, and you can knock this thing together in a weekend or a few days. And uh, to me, that seems like a really genius way to get people introduced to it and confident that they can build the thing, right? Um, sure. Do you guys think that would be something that would be worthwhile doing for me? I mean, it wouldn't be a profitable thing for me. I wouldn't lose money, but I wouldn't be, it'd be kind of a break even thing. But do you think that would be something that would be worthwhile to do? Do you think people would have interest in that or not really? I think it'd be beneficial, especially for people who just saw the plane at, at Sun and Fun or something and said, well, maybe I can build it. And they, they get that kit and it would be beneficial to get them excited about it. Um, I think it's a good idea. This is the first metal airplane I've built. So I've had to learn a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I would say that it's a really good idea to, to do uh, modular kits like that because um, some of the other avenues I was looking at from that regard would, would have been one year I would do the fuselage kit and then the next year I'd do the wing kit. And if school would actually fund it, it would never fly, but the students would continually think that the airplane will develop. 
Yeah. So yeah. You, you'd go either or, and then, then the following year, you'd do the tail kit, and then you'd have at some point enough pieces to put the airplane together. But right. having those pieces allows you to, hey, I, um, I'm i looking at, at something else that they they moved it into a, instead of an all-in-one purchase for 80000 you can buy this section, then this section, then this section, and split it up. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'd be very interested in going that direction too. Well, for you, Tom, I think that's something where, you know, I could probably do, um, I'll have to look in, look at it, but, uh, you know, it might be something where I can donate a few tail, you know, rudder kits, say, to you. So you get mm -hmm. five rudder kits and now a bunch of kids can take turns kind of putting stuff together, cleat going, riveting, whatever, um, you know, something like that. But, but yeah. then too, if it's, if it's pre-made, if it's just a matter of, you know, you aren't really, you know, you're drilling holes the size, but you're not really man, you know, manufacturing the parts. Right. Is that the same? So maybe, maybe there'd be the tack, the track of here. You can buy plans just for the rudder and buy some aluminum, buy right, some, right. You know, a couple other things. And now you can make yourself a rudder from scratch or something, but I don't know. Do metal working with them, but in the, first, uh, the first thing I have them do is a three by five inch little by inch wide top metal box. Um, mm -hmm. So that way they can kind of use use it for like rivet storage when they're making something else. And uh, with our student pickup day this past week, one of my students picked up all the metal he had. He was working on uh, building a. As crazy it is in an aviation class, he wanted to build a boat. So <laughs> it's this little little boat that's about yay long, but he picked all the metal up put it all together, figured out the way to bend the metal. So you, I told him you can't use anything other than rivets. Mm -hmm. And um, so he actually, like this past week, I got pictures yesterday from him he, in his garage, literally finished this thing. I'm like, great. I wish I had the ability to get you the material three weeks ago because that would have been something you could have been working on. But Yeah, yeah. Huh. Instead of That's bucking really the rivets, he popped them, but no big deal either way. Yeah. Looking like vans, they have a little kit, and you actually make an aluminum toolbox. I yeah, I've got one and sitting then, in my classroom as an example of what they can do. Yeah, and then Zenith has their wheel chalk you can make. Oh yeah, I'm in, I don't know about that one. Zenith's wheel chalks they're um, they're pretty neat, but they use a, a special extrusion for the for the um, top corner when they go together. Um, and yeah, so, they're, it's, they're, it's what they use for their launcher on yep. on the 750. Yeah, so, but yeah, it's pretty neat. So, um, yeah, I saw Vans did a they did some sort of a light kit or something that they used to do a little wing section too. I don't know if they still do it. Hey, I just posted uh, uh, um, Axel's website. I don't know if you follow Axel. He's over in Germany. But he has a very detailed website of 10 years of building the CX-4. And it's a month-by-month -month, uh, picture album. And he also has other information on his website, which is a uh, pretty neat setup. He's an interesting guy, and, and it looks like he does top-notch, uh, very high-quality work uh, in his build. Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of pop in there and look at that every once in a while. So, and the, That's a Corby Castrell, not a Boyer. Um, I, yeah. put the, I put the uh, link in there for that. Isn't that what Glenn Brad, um, Bradley flies or he used to fly or something he talks about a kestrel i think a fair amount at the time um it's probably the wooden version could be yeah different name i think a cassett was one thing that he's flown in that's what it is yeah i think you're right yeah Greg. yeah yeah okay. that's wood wings rag and tube fuselage okay I see some video from Chuck C now. Hey, Chuck. Thanks. Hi, how are you doing? Doing well. 
know if you the, want to introduce I'm, yourself or we can hear you. Yeah, I'm now. up in I'm up in Cadillac, Michigan. Okay. And uh, I just bought plans number eight from a guy whose wife had MS and he couldn't build the plane. And uh, I'm going over to Don Larson's house this evening, actually, to see what he's done. Um, cool. I've never, I'm not a pilot or anything, and I just want to always build an airplane. So. Awesome. Uh, Is it uh, yeah. plans for CX-4 or CX-5? or CX-5. Okay. Very cool. Good. Yeah. So I've been listening to the last couple of weekends. Four. What's that? I have number eight for the CX-4. Oh, nice. Very cool. Well, good. Thanks for joining us, Chuck. So what's, what's yeah, your background? You. Are you, you said you've always wanted to build an airplane, but you're not a pilot. What, what is your, have you gone flying um, before or just interested or? Yeah, I'd like to fly someday. And, and part of it's, you know, I can't really talk my wife into buying a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar airplane, but I can convince her for five hundred to a thousand dollars here and there. So, and uh, that's kind of the plan, really. But oh, good, awesome, very good. I'm a truck. Yeah, I'm a truck driver for FedEx. So, oh, okay, that's that's what I do. So, no real mechanical background. It's all right. It's it, yeah. Go to, go talk to Don, but uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I think. I mean, if you can, if you can, you know, measure accurately and use some basic hand tools. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's you know, there's there's a learning curve on you know reading the blueprints and stuff, but um, yeah, go talk to Don. He'll he'll show you the the ropes there. I think so. Get some, get some scrap aluminum, start drilling holes and practice, and uh, it'll come to you. <laughs> the, uh, what, yeah. <laughs> one thing that I, uh, one reason I chose this, I mean, I've looked at it um, like uh, tube construction, and um, there's a big learning curve with welding, and um, where this is basically, you know, like they talk about just basic tools that I already got in my shop. And uh, it kind of seemed like a project that I could finish. And uh, I don't know who puts the thing on Facebook. Um, I think he's on here. He's on here every once in a while um, where he has wh wh what he's built and he kind of goes through the problems that he's had. That's, that's been pretty good on understanding the blueprints because I never read blueprints before. So I pull them out gotcha. when I go through his, through his videos. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Good to have you, Chuck. Yeah, if you have any yeah, questions or, or issues or anything, just reach out. Uh, you, I assume you're aware of the the groups.io uh, uh, forum where most of us are on there? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm on the forum. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I was yeah. going to say, I haven't, haven't seen your, haven't seen, uh, you know, Chuck show up in any of the posts, but that's, you might not right, be I, active. Right. That's all right. No worries. Yeah, I, I just read through what everybody's talking about, so. Yeah, cool. Very good. Well, good. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So. Yeah, thanks. So, Chuck, where are you located? Uh, Cadillac, Michigan. Cadillac, Michigan. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. If you have any questions, shoot them. When do you get? When do you plan to get started? Um, probably in a month or so. I don't know. You guys can't see behind me, but I got a Jeep Wrangler that I've been messing with, uh -huh. and uh, I got to got to get that little thing fixed and. That's, I think that after that, I'm pretty free, so. Cool. But, yeah. It's like my one car garage also. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys can kind of see what I got going on back here. So, yeah, one car garage. I got, I got a lot more garage, but this is like my area of the garage. So, um, <laughs> the when it's all done, I, I, can, I can be the one that says that you can build this thing anywhere, so. <laughs> Very good. Cool. Oh, I see Tom asking about the wheel chalk. Yeah, let me let me go see if I can dig that up. It's on Zenith's um, uh, Zenith's website. Uh, I figured I put that in the chat because I'm trying to, like I said, when I make the kids do a little metal box, they go wheel chalks. That's a really cool idea. Yeah, here, let me send you this one. This one, it's it's a toolbox kit. 
Um, I'll put this in the chat as well. This is from that Van. That from Van, though, isn't it? Yep. Let me go yep, see if that I can one find I have. It. Oh, you have, okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you said that you already have that one. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I no, that's all right. Um, I actually, at Oshkosh last year, that was my biggest, like, I had to go get one of those because I didn't want to ship it in because it cost me less to go to Oshkosh to get it well, I mean, more fun than um, shipping it from <laughs> Van. Right. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, I'm, it's it's a uh, aircraft specialty that's making these. Let me see ah, if I can. Funny. Um. Yeah. Let me see if I can find. Hmm. Hey Doug, where are you on the patio? <laughs> I just got done finishing my honey list. I thought it would be longer <laughs> than it was later. Paint in the deck. Where are you located? Alexandria, Minnesota. Well, it looks like it's fairly really warm up north. <laughs> It's not, it's a beautiful day. A nice, cool breeze, dry. I got to, I got to try out the CX-4 with all those aileron uh, inputs I got and uh, I was going to share it with the group if we had time. Yeah, that'd be cool. It'd be good to see. <laughs> Turn my button over here. Looks like Ben's deep in research. Yeah, sorry. I'm looking at my my top monitor here. I was trying to find this uh, the wheel chocks for Tom. Um, all right, there you go. These are the ones. Um, it's kind of a hard to navigate site, but I'm pretty sure those are the ones that uh, we're talking about. I could be wrong, but here's the the site. Um, but anyways, yeah, Doug, did you, you said you wanted to show us something here. Well, I'm not at the hangar. I'm going to try to do that oh. one of these Saturdays. But uh, if you remember last week as builders, we talked about uh, what can we do when we have a heavy wing. And I know that's a lot of uh, concern for some of the guys on the Internet, it looks like. Um, and some of the RV builders or the experience from RV builders chimed in and said uh, to, uh, I think it was Tom I was talking to. Jeff, are you on today? I don't know. Um, anyways, I was given some information. I think it was from Jeff is his name out there. In, uh, oh, yeah. He, he's in the Minneapolis area. Um, yep. Jeff, uh, I'm dropping in his last name. I can't think of it. Something with a B. Yeah, but he gave me a – one of you guys, maybe it was Jeff, I mean, somebody else, but somebody gave me a, a Tom to talk to that had tried this uh, heavy wing issue. A real good guy. Talked to him a couple of times. And Anyways, long story short, I ended up taking the light wing and uh, putting – a couple of two buys on it and just testing a little at a time, uh, pressing it together, taking the roundness of the aileron out. And I got up and flew it on a calm morning this week. And I was just surprised and delightfully surprised Good. Uh, how much it really makes a difference and straighten the wing out so much so that, that if you remember, I had a, a trim tab riveted on the left aileron. And I originally started asking about, should I bring it to the end of the aileron? for more strength or leave it or bring it to the middle. And I ended up taking the aileron trim tab off. I didn't oh. need it. Which anytime you don't have a trim tab sitting on a wing That's anywhere, a it makes thing. the plane look better. Yeah. So, so just so, to confirm, you're, you were uh, basically sharpening the trailing edge of the aileron, right? Yeah. And in the so CX4 that, design, as you bend those over, maybe it's true in the five and the sevens. When you make your aileron, and I don't think they have ribs. I know they don't on the fours. You end up with a little bit of a bulge, so a cross section of the aileron may have a little yeah. hump to it. Yes. And by right. taking taking that hump out of it and sharpening the edge, and you will lose a little paint on the tip. There's no question. You got to go back and trim that up. 
uh, it does something to the aerodynamics. And I, honest to God, I've never flown the thing so so straight. It's absolutely hands off now. Awesome, good. That makes me happy yeah, that you straighten out. Very cool. Yeah, great. So uh, the, the group's working, the input's working. I appreciate it from uh, all those geniuses out there. <laughs> I say that <laughs> publicly. Yeah. Very good. That's a good report. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I was real, real pleased because it's, uh, you know, the fours, the fives, the sevens, the nines. I mean, they're all going to be, uh, I guess I've got too many numbers in there, but they're all going to be <laughs> a little, you know, yeah, it's not made out of a jig. You're going to have to tweak it a little, and it's just good information. Yeah, very much so. Awesome. Very good. Hmm. Cool. I so see, what uh, did we learn today while I was gone? Oh, we solved all the world's problems. Yeah. All did of we? Because you got to stop all that riding in Minneapolis here while you're at it. Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's sad stuff. But You're going to have to look at the rerun. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have to watch it on YouTube in a couple of days. So I will do I will do that when I get it. <laughs> once, I, once I get it up there, so. No, I was going to say, I saw uh, Kenny on here. I don't think we've seen your, you are uh, here before, have we? No, I, this is my first time being on. Um, Good, I'm, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from Florida. I followed the group for a long time. I uh, met Dave at uh, the Thomasville fly-in a couple of times, sat in the original CX-4. Uh, really enjoyed it. I'm just south of uh, Jack. Bill, where Harold has his I've seen him, met him, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, not really looking to build one yet. Uh, it's just because of uh, I already have a, a tri pacer, uh, okay. I haven't had time to fly. Uh, I have the plans for Legal Eagle and some of the pipe, uh, some of the tubing for the Legal Eagle. I haven't built that yet <laughs> because of my children going off to college. And now, with uh, you would think with this. COVID, I'm going to have all this time to build and all this time to work. And my kids said, no, dad, you're coming down to Orlando with us. So my wife and I are down here and we feel like teenagers. They won't let us leave the house and <laughs> we have to sit in the apartment the whole time. So, as you can see behind me, I've displaced a bunch of their stuff over into the corner so that we have room to, to, to stay down here. So, But I followed the, the CXs for a long time. My wife uh, has never been able to fly with me. Uh, so we would like to see if it, maybe get a five- she she was really impressed with the five and thinks it's a, it's beautiful. She liked the she liked the four, but she wasn't really thrilled with trying to learn on her own. So when she saw the five, she thought that would be a really nice airplane. Maybe she could do that with me. Yeah, very cool. And you've seen the seven is uh, is out and about now, right? Yes, I have. And uh, we had originally talked about doing side by side, but uh, I think it would be better. We're both fairly big people, and uh, every airplane we've ever sat together in, it's been kind of a, a real tight squeeze and you know, this gotcha. so we were thinking the possibility that the five seems to have a bit more uh wiggle room i guess yeah yeah also <laughs> also on the cx5 i found that uh getting into and out of the cockpit is a little easier with a roll bar to hang on to and and the, the calling whereas side by side you know i've flown a lot in uh rv12 rv12s uh the uh and, and those side by side planes and, and they're basically hard to get up, hard for me to get up out of the seat. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the big things about it. Too. We uh, didn't have the, uh, an RV 12, but there's a guy with an RV six and a six a in the chapter that, that I belong to up in uh, green cove. And, and we've had a, a experience with trying to get in and out of those. It's, it's not too bad for me, but it was uh, difficult for her. So we're, we're we're gonna look. We're gonna see. Uh, I've yeah. got, like I said, I've got lots of other projects I have to get taken care of first. But <laughs> big thing is get the kids out of college. <laughs> well, good. Thank you. You know, along that line, it was interesting to see Rob Flood's CX-5 last week, and he actually used uh, square steel tubing for his front um, canopy structure, which he admitted was, you know, of course, a weight penalty to do that, but it allowed the fasteners to be inside that square tube, nothing protruding on the bottom, but he actually had something um, significant um, to brace himself with getting uh, in and out. Yeah, exactly. That, that looked like a kind of a nice, a nice design there. So. 
Yeah, and and I'm, I'm just south of where they build the Panther. The SPA oh. Panthers. Uh, I've, I've gone and looked at how they've done some of their stuff too. Uh, uh, I like some of the, the design features that they've done with that. It's a, it's, I've, I've looked into different possibilities. <laughs> Very good. Cool. So I had a topic. I figured if things got quiet, I'd bring up and see what you guys thought about this. So, um, so there's two things. So one is don't don't forget there's the SpaceX launch today, which is at three twenty two, I think, or something Eastern time. So don't forget about that. That's I'm excited about that. I don't know. I'm really excited. That'll be kind of yes, three twenty two. Cool. Okay, Eastern. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and if it doesn't launch today, it'll be tomorrow, I believe. Uh, they have a, a backup for tomorrow. Uh, the other one that I saw this week, Cessna flew uh, an electric airplane. Um, and let me see if I can pull up the article. I had it here and I have now misplaced it on my computer somewhere. Give me a second here. Um, I think it was Cessna anyways. Um, yeah, nine passenger, all electric Cessna 208. Flew for 30 minutes on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so Magnix is, or it's M-A-G-N-I-X is the engineering firm that, that, uh, handled putting the electric engine in that. So what do you guys think about all this, uh, electric aircraft, uh, stuff? Do you think that's something that's going to be pretty popular? Like it has become now in the RC world, or do you think it's something that's kind of just, uh, you know. Yeah, it'll, you know, have as niche areas. It's, I think it'd be great in a sailplane. That and training airplanes. Um, I went at the one conference I was at, we saw one that they're developing in Denver um, that's all electric. And the, the, the intention was to bring it into the training fleet so the training could go down. Um, yeah. For short haul, like hour flights, just replace the battery pack, do another flight, and it would charge in 25 minutes. Um, Kenmore Air in Seattle, um, they just did a, I believe it was, what is it, Twin Otter? Or one of their aircraft they're converting to electric as well for like short haul flights over in, in that area. So this same article about the Cessna says, it says the same engineering firm, Magnix, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, propelled the first commercial electric flight of a de Havilland DHC-2 Beaver in December. So that might yeah. be this, that might be the one maybe? That's that's the one I'm thinking of that that okay. happened. It was Kenmore Air's D, uh, DH two. Very cool, but yeah, I saw that. It's I don't know. I I get kind of fired up about new technology and stuff. I mean, I don't know. I mean, to your point, Tom, about the the place in Denver, I had forgotten about those guys, but I, I think they were at Air Venture two years ago, and I talked with them for a while. But um, the idea of using it for a trainer would be fantastic because you're all your charging station can be at one location. You just take off from there, fly around for a while, come back, land, swap battery packs. You're good to go. You know, That'd actually, be fantastic versus it, cross countries, but it's actually called by aerospace B Y E. And it's called the, of all things as uncrazy as this is the E flyer. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. I think they just put up a really large new, um, um, I think they put a whole new production facility in place out in Denver somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, like, I saw the prototype airplane. It looks really, really cool. Yeah. Hydrogen fuel. Cells, I think they're going to be the longer term. What did you say? Hydrogen fuel, fuel, Hydr the fuel cells. Ah, uh, okay. yeah. Hydrogen fuel cells. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that's the biggest issue with electric is just the the charging time, right? So, um, right, right now, and you you have just as much dead weight on takeoff as you do on landing. So yes, yeah. I don't know. I I think you're going to have to put me down for one of these uh, carbon footprint type guys that likes to hear the rumble of a straight pipe four cylinder four stroke engine. <laughs> I I. I almost feel like I should be apologizing today's times, but it's just, there's something about it since I was a little kid listening to those engines on mini bikes and go-karts and cars and race cars. And, uh, and now to have a, 
uh, four stroke engine, straight pipe coming up by your feet with those little thatchers. Uh, my son, my son said it best when I first flew it. He said, uh, Dad, when that thing flew overhead, it sounded like a Harley Davidson in the sky. <laughs> and I don't think you'll ever get that sound out of an electric airplane. And, and I, you know, I'm all for technology too. I hope it does take off, but it's just a, it's an affectionate thing. It just, uh, it just, it's just cool. There's something about going to the drag strip and having that thump of those top fuel cars hitting your in the chest. You know, that's, that's yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. The smell of you know that uh, that high octane gas is pretty, pretty addictive. But yeah, I, I like the I, I like the. Um, I wouldn't consider myself a tree hugger. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to pollute, but I mean, I also like, you know. But I like the idea of the the electric. Like, it's quiet. It's in theory, it's sufficient, I guess. It's, you know, the recharging ability. I don't know. There's just there's a lot of neat things about it. Um, I think. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, for, there's something to be said for the, the, uh, the emotion you get from, you know, riding a Harley or, or, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah. There's, there's a guy out of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota here. He took a peat pole and he put a golf cart electric motor on it with a propeller. And he really? shoved as many batteries as he could in there to get the thing. And it was the funniest thing. He, he thought he had his weight and balance all figured out and taxied out in the runway, and it never got off the ground. Oh. It just, it just all you, the technology with the ion lithium, whatever batteries now, the lighter, it's uh, just, just bring open some of the door, all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. There's a company, I think they're down in Florida, making electric motors for, um, like Martin said, kind of, or I think it was Martin, uh, the uh, kind of uh, self-launching gliders and and whatnot. I had talked with them a couple of years ago about um, what it would take to, or maybe maybe even ultralights. And I know there's there's actually a couple of guys that have, or a couple of companies that make uh, electric battery pack and engine kits for the powered parachute guys. Um, but again, it kind of goes back to you, you kind of have to fly from point A back to point A in order to get, you know, you can't really do, you know, trips per se, or, you know, if it's, you know, not back at your car, then how do you, you know, you can't just gas up and go, you got to have some, I don't know. So I don't, I don't know how that all is going to work out, but um, yeah, there's, there's some neat stuff out there with that, but. I think future experimental aircraft that are electric should just have custom speaker systems installed in it, and you could uh, be whatever you want it to be. You could really have fun with it. <laughs> there you go. You could sound like a turbine or a Harley, depending upon the day. Yeah, I'm in on that deal. <laughs> Surprisingly, they're doing that with buses because the electric buses are too quiet. <laughs> too many people getting hit by quiet buses. The deal? Yeah, they were getting. They, I forgot what another conference I was. I hate to keep bringing that up, but um, I was going around and uh, I'm, I'm hearing this weird sound coming from the bus in one specific spot, and I go, "That that's not an engine. That's this electric bus on the side." And I'm listening to it, and it sounds like a combustion engine, hmm. and it it revs just like it would be if the bus was running, but it's so that they don't get hit. Hmm. Huh? I'll be darned. So, side note, something else interesting going on today. Um, Sun and Fun Online is doing a live air show uh, starting in 45 oh. minutes or so, similar to what they did for the, the three day live air show on, or the online air show. Um, they're doing a benefit air show today. Huh. Interesting. It's like live air show TV dot com or something I forgot what it was but uh one to four o'clock they're doing like little snippets of different things for sun and fun especially for the um the school that that kind of helps support down there at that airport um major major i know the youth initiative down there where that sun and fun helps with i think it's cool. right on their website yeah so, if you go to fly fly snf.org yeah. it's there's a bunch of links and information about it here i'll put it in the chat here um Cool. Thanks, Tom. That's good. Very cool. Yeah, it looks like it's to it. Is it the Central Florida Aerospace Academy 
Yeah. Aerospace the... Center for Excellence, Florida Air Museum, and Lakeland Aero Club are the things that it's uh, they're promoting or, or sponsoring or something, it looks like. Huh. Well, that's pretty cool. I'll have to start with fire that up and watch that for a while here today. Yeah, I'll have you right after SpaceX. Well, it says, it says it starts in 41 minutes. So, they site. might actually hopefully break into the SpaceX launch. Yeah. Well, it's pretty yeah, cool. Ben and hold of Glenn at all? Haven't talked to him for a while. Um, I need to do that and just to catch up. Yeah, I know he had talked about it um, a couple of weeks ago, but I don't know, if, just kind of a bad time, date and time. But um, I know last week we were talking about doing something. I think we're going to try on Tuesday this week. Um, and I need to send out information about that. But basically, it'll be the same the same, I think the same meeting information, but it'll just be on Tuesday evening this week. Uh, I needed to nail down what time, but um, just to do a different time, maybe some other people can join that, can't join that on Saturday morning. So, um, yeah. A lot of people are flying on Saturday. Yeah, more power to them. So, or honeydew lists or, you know, family yeah. things or whatever. So, but, yeah. yeah. We're driving them all. Yeah. Honeydew lists. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we will wrap it up here. Unless anybody has any other questions or topics or anything else, um, we get back to building or flying or honey do lists, I guess. So, <laughs> thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, Ben. Enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, ben. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Take Thank care, you. Ben. Yeah. Thanks for joining, everybody. Well, have a good weekend. <laughs>